in southeastern Michigan, roughly 40 miles apart, lie the remains of two men who were officers in the Union Army during the American Civil War, Christian Rath and Richard Watts. Both of these men had a role in hanging four people who were convicted of conspiring to kill President Abraham Lincoln. In this last episode in the series, we'll take a look at these two men and their part in the executions. Christian Rath was born in 1831 in what is now modern-day Germany. At the age of 19, he emigrated to the U.S. after operating with a band of revolutionaries. After serving in the U.S. Navy, he moved with a fellow sailor to Jackson, Michigan, where he became a shoemaker and started a family. When the American Civil War broke out, Rath helped recruit for the local 17th Michigan Volunteers, also known as the Stonewall Regiment. Rath became a second lieutenant and saw action in several battles. His wounding at the Battle of Antietam would leave him with some permanent medical issues. Meanwhile, Captain Richard Watts had been born on a Mercer County, Ohio farm in 1838. At the age of 18, he traveled to Adrian, Michigan to attend the local Adrian College. When the Civil War began, he enlisted in the 1st Michigan Volunteer Regiment. Watts was wounded several times during the war, the last time being on April 2, 1865, during the final assault on Petersburg, Virginia, just a week before Lee's surrender. Watts was home in Michigan recovering when he learned of Lincoln's assassination. A few weeks later, he returned to duty as a staff officer to Union General John Hartrant. It would be an historic assignment. After Lincoln's assassination, a decision was made to reactivate the old federal penitentiary on the grounds of the Washington Arsenal Complex in southeastern Washington, D.C. This was done both to provide a place for the Lincoln Conspiracy Trial and to house those who would be put on trial there. Union General Winfield Scott Hancock had been appointed commander of the military district that included Washington, D.C., and so was in command of the prison there. Hancock had General John Hartrant placed in charge of the day-to-day -day operation of the prison. Hartrant had Christian Rath, now a captain, assigned to his staff as a provost marshal, which was the Union Army's military police. While previously acting as a provost marshal, Rath had once been required to build a gallows, and his experience might be useful. When the trial concluded and four of the prisoners were sentenced to death by hanging, Rath was given the job of executioner. He drew up plans for gallows based on his previous experience and had the Arsenal Workshop build it. Work began immediately and continued through the night, finally completing just hours before the gallows would be used. Meanwhile, Rath sent over to the nearby Navy Yard for four wooden equipment boxes to be used for coffins, along with a good Navy rope. Rath took pieces of the rope and fashioned four nooses. Saving the noose for Mrs. Surratt for the last, and feeling quite a bit of fatigue, he only used five turns for her noose instead of the usual seven. He was also assuming a last-minute reprieve would arrive for Mrs. Surratt, and she wouldn't be hanged anyway. Rath also went to the Arsenal storehouse and obtained a tent, from which he cut binding strips, and also made four crude hoods to place over the heads of the condemned before the hanging. Since Rath could not get any volunteers to dig graves for the condemned, he had to give orders to have the work done, 
The graves were roughly about three feet deep. That same Thursday, July 6th, 1865, the four condemned prisoners learned their fates when Generals Hancock and Hartrant visited each in their cells and read their sentences. The sound of the scaffolding being built must have only added to their trauma. The next day, July 7th, was another hot and miserably humid Friday. Spectators and reporters began to arrive with their special passes, allowing them admittance. Among the arrivals was the famed photographer Alexander Gardner and his assistant, Timothy O'Sullivan. They set up cameras in these windows of the old penitentiary workshop, facing east toward the scaffold. While Gardner and O'Sullivan were waiting, they took this photo of the gallows, which had just been completed a short time earlier. The prisoners were to be led up the steps to the scaffold, approximately 10 feet above ground. Another 10 feet up from the floor was a horizontal wooden beam from which the ropes were hung. There was to be enough slack in the ropes for the condemned to drop about six feet. The hope being that a drop of six feet would be enough to cause instant unconsciousness, followed by death soon after. There were two trap doors, or drops as they were called, one for each pair of prisoners. Each drop was held in place from underneath by a pair of vertical wooden beams. Soldiers would be placed under the scaffold to knock each beam away at the moment of execution. There were numerous reporters present at the gallows that day, and various accounts were written about what occurred. This account primarily comes from the one printed in the Washington Evening Star the same day as the execution. At a few minutes to 1 p.m., a guard assembled around the scaffold. At around 1.15 p.m., General Hancock emerged through the prison door, followed shortly after by General Hartrand, who in turn was followed by his assistants, Colonel L.A. Dodd and Lieutenant Colonels McCall and Fredrickson, along with the prisoners and their various attendants. Mrs. Mary Surratt came first, generally described as having difficulty walking and needing to be supported by the Union officers on either side one of whom was Lieutenant Colonel McCall. She was followed by two Catholic priests, Fathers Jacob Walter and Bernadine Wygett. She wore a long black dress, bonnet, and veil, and like the others was chained at the wrists and ankles. Given the terrible heat and humidity, along with the circumstances, her suffering must have been extreme, both physically and mentally. Following behind was German immigrant George Atzerodt, who had been assigned the task of murdering Vice President Johnson, but had failed to go through with it. He was accompanied by soldiers and two clergymen, Chaplain Winchester and Lutheran minister Dr. J. Butler. He wore the same salt and pepper suit of coarse material that he had worn during the trial. He was bareheaded and later Dr. Butler placed a white handkerchief over his head to shield him from the sun while on the scaffold and additionally held an umbrella over him for a time. Like the others, he was in his stocking feet. Reportedly this was done in case he urinated during the hangings. This way no urine would collect in shoes or boots. Following Atzerodt was David Harold, who had been with Lewis Powell when he tried to kill Secretary of State William Seward, and was with John Wilkes Booth when they were cornered in a tobacco barn in Virginia. The clergyman accompanying Harold was Reverend Dr. Olds of Christ Episcopal Church. Harold was described as looking the most miserable physically of the lot, with a dirty face and clothes, wearing a slouch hat with the brim turned down. 
Like all the others, Harold was also attended by Union guards. The last prisoner in the procession was Lewis Powell, who also went by the alias of Lewis Payne. Along with the guard, Powell was accompanied by two clergymen, Reverend Dr. Gillette of the First Baptist Church and Reverend Dr. Stryker of Baltimore. He wore a close-fitting jersey shirt described as sailor blue. One account says his eyes were somewhat reddened as well as his face, but otherwise his demeanor seemed to be the calmest of the four prisoners. He was wearing a straw hat that one account says he took from the head of Lieutenant Colonel McCall, who he was on good terms with. With difficulty, especially for Mrs. Surratt, the prisoners slowly made their way up the 13 steps of the scaffold. Mrs. Surratt was led to a chair at the far north end of the platform and she collapsed into it, leaning on her right arm as her priests attended to her. A soldier held an umbrella over her to try and shield her from the sun. Lewis Powell was seated next to Mrs. Surratt on the same drop. Captain Rath can be seen here with the white coat and hat. Harold and Atzerat, in that order, were seated over the second drop. Harold's lips were seen to move along with the prayers being recited to him by Dr. Olds. General Hartrant made his way to the front and in what was described as a clear voice, read the prisoners the death warrants. Once the warrants had been read, the various clergymen had another consultation with the condemned. Following that, clergymen spoke publicly and offered prayers on behalf of the prisoners they were attending. The condemned were bound with the cloth strips that Captain Rath had made. Here the nooses had been placed around the men's necks, with Captain Rath adjusting David Harold's. George Atzerodt had cried out, Don't choke me! when his noose was being adjusted. The cap has already been placed over Powell's head. Captain Rath later claimed that he had told Powell, whom he had gotten to know quite well, I want you to die quick. To which Powell replied, You know best, Captain. Next to Powell, Mrs. Surratt leans against one of the priests as she is being bound. Corporal William Coxhall, standing at his post under the trapdoor supporting Powell and Surratt, hears Mrs. Surratt complain that her bindings are too tight, and gets a reply of, well, it won't hurt long. After each noose was adjusted so that the knot was placed under each prisoner's left ear, the caps were placed over their heads, and each was stood up on their trapdoors. Just before the cap was placed on Atzerodt's head, he tried with difficulty to speak, finally saying, gentlemen, take wear, evidently meaning don't follow our example. This is the last photo of the condemned before the drops fell. Corporal Coxall is seen leaning against the far left beam below the scaffold. The heat, nausea, and stress got the better of him and grabbing the post for support, he had vomited. Mrs. Surratt, close to fainting, murmured, please don't let me fall, probably meaning she couldn't remain standing much longer. At Surratt, through his cap, bid everyone farewell with the hope of meeting again in a better world. Captain Rath waved everyone back from the trapdoors and began to clap his hands three times, each time prompting Atzerodt to exclaim, Oh! On the third hand clap, the soldiers under the scaffold knocked the support beams out from under each trapdoor, each of which swung down with a loud thud. The four bodies shot downward. Corporal Coxwell later said that Mrs. Surratt, unlike the other three, did not drop straight down 
She had been standing so close to the back of the trapdoor that when it fell, her body lurched forward and slid off, jerking at the end of the rope and swinging like a pendulum. There was a momentary twitching of her limbs. When Powell, next to Mrs. Surratt, fell, he reportedly drew his limbs up to almost a sitting position several times, and his whole body shook for a few moments. Harold also showed signs of struggle for a time, and then went limp and urinated. Atzerod appears to have died without any signs of struggle. Within five or six minutes, none of the condemned showed any signs of life. After waiting at least 20 minutes, doctors examined the four and pronounced them all dead. In this image, you can see the rough coffins stacked next to the shallow graves, which the condemned almost certainly saw on their way to the scaffold. By the time Gardner and O'Sullivan had relocated their cameras to take this image, the coffins had been moved to a position in front of the gallows. Shortly after, the bodies were cut down and placed in their coffins, still wearing their hoods. Captain Watts placed a bottle containing the name of the deceased in each coffin, so there would be no misidentification later should the bodies ever be exhumed. The coffins were then sealed and hastily buried. After the execution, Captain Rath was given a promotion and then honorably discharged 12 days later. He returned to Jackson and the shoe trade but eventually found work as a mail clerk for the railroad while also owning a farm. Reportedly, Rath was haunted by the executions, especially that of Mrs. Surratt, and years went by before he spoke publicly about the hangings. One source says he had recurring nightmares where Mrs. Surratt's daughter, Anna, would come to him crying hysterically and demanding to know why he had killed her mother. It's been noted how incredibly appropriate Christian Rath's name was for being the executioner, as the prisoners certainly were subjected to Christian Rath. In April 1892, newspapers reported that Rath had suddenly gone insane, but the very next day reported that he was recovering and should be back at work within a few weeks. Apparently, he had some sort of breakdown, obviously not meeting our modern definition of insanity. Rath's wife died in 1908, and Rath followed her in death on February 14, 1920. He was 88 years old. Both are buried here, in Mount Evergreen Cemetery in Jackson. Richard Watts left the army in the fall of 1865 and returned to life in Adrian. He became a lawyer and was a local judge for many years. He died in June 1920 and is buried here in Oakwood Cemetery near Adrian. Near the end of his life, he wrote an account of his experiences regarding the Lincoln Conspirators' trial and executions. This account was published in Michigan History Magazine two years after his death. The Lincoln assassination was filled with many coincidences, including the tale of these two men who had worked together and lived so close to each other dying only four months apart. 